<clears throat> right, I think we're back up. Wow, better late than never, eh? Um, well, when I when I get the drop frames, i.e. the intermittent bandwidth going up and down, normally the best thing to do is actually restart the um, the internet modem and switch. So uh, that's what I did. However, on this occasion, it seemed to um, take a long excursion somewhere. Uh, and I had to repeat the process a couple of times before it came back up. Which is um, painful. However, we are now going and frame wise, we're good. Uh, drop frames 116, that's modest. It's only 1.6 percent. Thanks, Ed. Um, can I just have a quick sound chat? How are we doing on volumes? Is it coming through at the right sort of volume? Hopefully it's not distorting. I've got a slightly different mic set up. Um, same microphone, it's just I don't have the mixer in between now, so I'm relying on controlling the volume through the, um, the active mic amplifier. I'm not sure if that's given me enough control. Ed seems to think it's okay, which is good. Laurie agrees. Excellent. So I can continue then. Um, right. I've got to remember what I was doing. Hold on. Let me get my. I did make some notes here somewhere. Being very organised. So where were we last time? Um, I think we were dealing with getting the board out so hold on let me just see if I could switch over to a proper view there we go and let me see if I can get myself and the browser hold on why is that in front of me interesting let's just switch to that view hopefully you can see the browser as well now so um, probably I wonder if I should zoom this actually so last time we were just finishing off the boards and um, I did make some changes but uh, here's the order that's sitting there at the moment just remind you what this was like yes I do like the finish that they've got but it does remind me a little bit of um, Bush Park's After Dark and it definitely doesn't come out like that <laughs> Oh, Ed's on limited battery. Um, I will try and finish at 10 tonight, or try not to go beyond 10, because uh, I need to um, do some other bits and bobs. Um, the board, uh, one of the things that I did was, if you look at the antenna area there, that was all um, carved out in the layers. So I managed to find a way to isolate those areas so that it weren't getting filled because it's a four layer board the inner layers were filling in you can't have a on the footprint you can put in a restrict and a keep out for top and bottom but you can't put intermediate layer um, cutouts in there so I manually had to add a, a cutout polygon on those layers to make sure that they don't go under the antenna so we've got a free bit of um, 
uh, copper free area there underneath the antenna which was kind of important um, I also messed around I don't know I think I added the diode on the USB input juggled a few things around to make the power a bit more stable and give myself a little bit more room on the board um, can I see yeah I might be able to see the bottom there as well well that's a lot less interesting uh, yeah I did some work on a silk screen I also changed the logo on the new one but not on this order because that was ordered before all, the, all those changes okay and I'll go and show you what that looks like again in a minute let me um, get out of here just briefly and go back um, I've ordered a stencil as well something else I did was I figured it would probably be a good idea to have like a board to just break stuff out which will help on the testing and things so uh, I, I'll have a look through the CAD on this I should be able to open that CAD up um, so I ordered this it's a relatively simple board really it exposes the feather connectors so that I can add feather boards several of them and um, it adds a mix mod onto the board as well which you can see here so I can add in P mods nicely so that would be kind of handy from a testing point of view plus I've added a discrete power input and um, a battery adapter because one thing I figured is if you were going the wing route that's what they call these boards that have multiple feathers on them because you quite often put your feather in the middle you can't get access to the battery connector so I've got an external one although I guess you could put it on the left hand side and have the other boards there but so I've ordered that as well um, one of the things that you will also notice is when I ordered this one I ordered it with the old silk screen on that had the old name in so what happened is there was a discussion on the forum around naming or the start of one um, turns out that icicle is also used in the name or as part of the name of a number of sorry of a an FPGA development board which was really annoying so it means that we can't easily use that because it's going to be confusing uh, it's actually called icicle kit uh, when I saw it I thought it was just like a bundle and I didn't realize that was the actual name of the board so um, we can't use that name um, there was quite a bit of a, lot, a discussion about that on the forum but um, we didn't really take it to its natural conclusion there was conversation about using the black ice name when I originally started this board before it became what it is now um, it was actually called black ice ultra but it departed quite a long way from black ice so I was um, uncomfortable really with reusing the black ice moniker on this particular board because it represents quite a big change compared to the previous black ice boards for one it's not based around the ice 40 hx chipset which all of the other black ice boards including the original my sql board were based around this one is based around the ice 5 5k which is um, a slightly different animal secondly as i mentioned before this is this represents a slightly different if you like a more opinionated uh, and integrated and narrower solution for FPGA um, so one of the things that I thought 
would be good is if we could represent um, something in the name uh, that that fitted with the aims of the board, which is uh, this combination of ideas coming together into this more narrower or more focused, should I say, solution. I also wanted the name to be a bit shorter and sweeter, quite frankly. Uh, not only because it's easier to fit on the damn board, which is very small and has very little room on it. Um, it just seems sensible to have uh, something that's short and sweet. So I wanted something that suggested fusing the different elements together, which in this case is fusing the von Neumann architecture and the FPGA side of thing and unifying those with an approach so that they were designed to be used together. I know that feature existed before in Black Ice um, in terms of a link between the two, but it was never easy to use. Um, and Black Ice was very generic in terms of the tools that you were expected to use with this. Whereas I'm going to be more narrow with this, even though you can use different tool sets, I'm going to focus on developing a certain combination of tools based around MMIGEN on the Python side and then micro Python type approach. Um, on the driver side and linking those together so you get a more continuous uh, integration. So let me bring that cut up first. Hold on. I'm going to just drop the browser down and let me just get the CAD running. How's everyone doing this evening, by the way? Apologize for the delays. Oh, broke the lock on those files. Hold on, delete the lock. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I wonder if I can make this a little bigger. I think I can squeeze in something slightly bigger. Hold on, there we go. Let me set. There's a light there, dots. So um, this is slightly different in that it's got the newer silk screen on it. So it's going to look different to my prototype when it arrives. Uh, most importantly, what you will see here is the, um, the new name. So it, I wanted a name that really did represent that combination of the two pieces working together, the hardcore, if you like, and the FPGA, the, you know, micro Python mixture of MMIGEN. So the name that I've come up with that I quite like is Alloy, because Alloy itself represents a, a fusion of um, materials. It's nice, it's short and sweet. It fits on the board, which is also a bonus. I've also got rid of my little cloud thing and I brought back the MY from the MyStorm to use as uh, a little moniker there to represent the MyStorm part. So I don't know what you guys think 
on that name. I'm sure I'm going to get some feedback on it, but I'm, I quite like quite like the name Alloy. It represents something different, something new. It is short and sweet. Um, and in this case, it's actually um, I'm using the stop layer to actually draw the lettering, which is going to be interesting. See how that comes out. What else have I changed? Have I changed anything else on this? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, let me just check. So I probably will post this on the forum at some point. In fact, I can get that done. In a bit. So please do let me know your thoughts, guys. The uh, thing I've been working on this week is really getting my head round how the various different pieces of this are going to work. So I'm trying to start on the development side. Um, the the microcontroller just to remind you that i'm using here is esp32 uh, s2 now the important thing about the s2 is it has the usb which is what we need whereas the previous generations of the esp32s didn't have that it's a fairly important feature so one of the interesting things about that is uh, in order to get going, I um, purchased this kit, which I may have shown you last week, which is called the Kaluga, Kaluga 1. It actually comes in a couple of layers, so it's like, um, so it comes with this rather, um, Big and flashy PCB just for doing touch. I mean, they've really gone to town on it. That actually looks quite sharp. But they literally give you a whole PCB just that's been etched and designed for the touch controls. And then there's an FPC uh, connector on there. To enable you to hook it up to the um, to the main Kaluga development board. In addition, something else that you can connect up, which is quite nice to include, is the uh, one of these little um, camera boards. So. Get this to focus. There we go. Again, all done in this uh, lovely black. So uh, one of the OVR cameras. I can't remember which one this is. I think it's an OVR 2600 or 7600 range. More than good enough for our approach and testing. And that uses a parallel interface. It's like an 8-bit interface. So you get eight data lines. You get a Pixel clock, H sync, V sync, uh, and you normally have to feed it um, like a, a clock to operate. Kind of 24 megahertz normally, something of that nature. Although on some of the bigger PCBs, you don't need to do that, they put that on the PCB itself. Certainly when you do the FPC versions, um, you need to do that. So in addition to that, you get um, the boards that go on top, of which there is two. Uh, let's see if I can get this off. So 
at the very top you get this great looking uh, LCD screen which connects via the 0.1 headers on the bottom and that sits on the top layer then sandwiched in between the LCD and the main card you get this and this is uh, basically so if I get a good pick on that I'm gonna have better cameras for this soon but anyway this is basically an audio board also has some buttons here as well it's kind of handy audio output digital audio etc uh, not sure how much use I'll get off that. That's interesting. So the um, the LCD board fits on top of the audio board. And then all of this sits on top of the main board to so that would effectively sit on there so this is the main board which is the most important piece and on it, it has the iRoom model for the S2 here, which is the module that they sell separately. If you want to do a modular approach, I did think about going that route and using a module, but fitting it into a smaller kind of feather form factor just wouldn't have made sense. We would have ended up with probably a really long board not only that it's not in the right position from a connection point of view um all the other stuff on here i mean there's all sorts of things you've got all of the uh you know, if you can see these dip switches they've got the capped on tape on them still so that enables you to disconnect various ios it also has if you look closely i don't know if i can look on there has an FTDI chip which is a bit of a shocker to an expressive they normally use the uh, Chinese CH or CP sorry chips on their uh, devices to provide the serial port but so but this does JTAG as well as the serial so um, that's why they've gone with that Um, interestingly, if you look at the USBs, there's two USBs. Can I get a focus on that? And one of them is obviously for the FTDI for the serial over USB plus a JTAG. The other is just called a power connector and the really odd thing is why on earth they didn't connect the um gpio 19 and 20 which are the pins on the microcontroller that have the otg usb it's just extraordinary i don't i can't understand why they wouldn't connect those up to the other usb on here so they expect you to go and buy a separate like USB to header pins and fit them on here, which is what I've seen other people that are developing for the S2 actually do. It's completely nuts. So um, I had a good look at the circuit diagram and turns out there's a couple of test points Let me see if I can show you. There's a couple of test points for the um, put, 
in front of the USB. Hold on, let me see if I can get a. This isn't the best camera in the world for this. So if we look at the USB end, let me just see if I can come out a little. So you can see where we're looking. We're looking at uh, these USB connectors here. Okay. That's awkward. Let me just see if we can focus on that. So there you can see the two USB connectors on the board. And this is the USB that's connected to the JTAG and the serial port. And then this USB here is just simply connected to the power. But if you zoom in, which I can do here. Yeah. I'll come to it from the top actually, that would be nice. So if you look there, there is a D minus and a D plus. There's a lot of resin there from the flux. I haven't cleaned it up. I need to scrub it and then um, put some glue on just to make sure it's stable. So there's a couple of test points there for D minus and D plus. So I've put some mod wire on there and then that goes back around the board and enables uh, and is connected to the GPIO 19 and 20 uh, underneath. Probably, maybe see my botched efforts here. Bit messy. That's me connecting to the underside of those connectors for GPIO 19 and 20. To see them there. Now, um, when, when I started playing with the, um, with the Kaluga dev board, um, what, what, what you get is an awful lot of software, but it's all quite organized and the install uh, ads, it, it does take quite a long time to actually install it. Because uh, it goes and downloads all sorts, because it downloads the compiler for the extensor and all sorts of different bits and pieces. Um, and it's called ESP hyphen IDF, or it's just known as IDF um, to developers, and it's an integrated development framework. And so, of course, the first thing I did was I thought, oh, well, let's get it all on there. And I eventually got it on there. Uh, just running in Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL, which is where I do most of this stuff at the moment on this laptop. And um, I thought, oh, I'll just have a quick look through the examples. And then I dug through and I found um, a Blinky. And I ran the Blinky and... Um, It just didn't do what I expected. Let me see if I can connect this and you'll kind of probably see. Let's 
and you kind of get a green light come on here yeah. and that's to do with the charger and stuff there's a bit of red light flickering as well which you probably can't see and then above that yeah, the FTDI around here you've got a couple of lights as well a couple of LEDs there's a red LED and a blue LED um, when you when you program it in this case I wasn't using JTAG I was just using the IDF flashing if you like flash command uh, first of all it tries to operate at 460,000 uh, board uh, and I got errors all the time it wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't finish um, and then eventually I worked out how to change the board rate and I took it down to 115 200 and now it works fine 115 200 eventually got it on there and of course what I see is a red light red LED flash and then I see the kind of blue do this really strange like occasional flash like this I'm thinking well, that's a really weird duty cycle and then I remembered oh wait a minute this is all running the way that the IDF framework runs is it actually installs an RTOS on there and runs it as an RTOS thread and it uses RTOS timing etc it's not using a hard timer to flash the led and i thought oh well, maybe it's ram robbing between the threads um so that's why the duty cycle is so messed up and we're just getting little little bits and bobs rather than the full flash and it took me a while to realize that the leds i was looking at are, are the ftdi leds flashing in response to the transmission because in the blink example not only does it flash the leds or flash an led supposedly but it actually says get reports the state back over the ur over the serial port so it says led on led off led off, LED off. so that flashing is really just the tx and the rx stuff um and I was thinking, ah, oh, well, it's not that. Because I'd tried changing the timings and stuff, and it wasn't making any difference. It just wasn't doing what I was expecting it to. Of course, and I was completely chasing rainbows. So the most bonkers thing. So having showed you what you get with this Kaluga One development kit, which is quite a bargain. It's like £40 or something. I don't know. $40 maybe or $50. You get all this really good stuff, you know, the LCD display, the audio thing, the camera, this touchpad, plus a baseboard with a module on it and everything. But what they don't give you is a bloody LED connected to the uh, to the to the module or the um, microcontroller and the module. So when you run this blink, there's no LED to blink. So it, it, even though it uses, um, I wonder if I can open it. Bear with me a sec, because <laughs> it's this was just bonkers to me that it did this. I wonder if I can open the uh, file. Uh, open recent. Um, let me see if I can add this in. Bear with me a sec so that you can you guys can see this as well. Add add a new window. Uh, Okay. 
Okay. Get rid of the um, pro hold on. Oh, that may be a bit small. Hold on. So, yeah, literally, if you look at this, you can see what it's doing here. Um, so, look, here we go. Turning on, turning off LED. And then GPIO set level. Blink GPIO. And then it's using the task delay from the RTOS. So that all seems pretty sensible. But of course, all I was seeing is this message being sent out, flashing on that uh, on those those LEDs, which were really just the um, just the transmission lights, transmission status. So, um, if we go and look, I've now defined this. Originally, that was that was set to some random variable called blink LED which turns out to be nothing I it's not predefined you're meant to define that the reason it's not predefined of course is because they don't have any LEDs that they can flash on the damn board despite the fact that they've got one two three four freestanding LEDs now there is one of these dot star LEDs on there which you can use with the um, serial driver which is a data and a clock it's like a two-line driver thing you, you know that's kind of a complicated thing to start off you just want to be able to flash an led so in the end i just kind of rigged up a, a little led uh to it to uh to flash So yeah, that was kind of weird, really. Um, <laughs> what are they thinking? You know, put a damn LED on the board. How difficult is that? You know, one that you can actually flash. So um, anyhow, I did that, and obviously the code you're looking at there is really the um, using the IDF framework. Obviously, this is C. You can see them calling into the various parts of the framework. As you see, it's based on free RTOS. It's also got a great like little uh, menu config. You know, if you use Linux, you will know what menu config is. It's got a menu config for setting up the various different features and stuff. So it's quite sophisticated in that sense. So yeah, that was a bit surprising starting to use that. Now, interestingly, the um, the next step beyond just getting it to work with the IDF, so I then knew that that was working. I spent quite a bit of time um, looking at what I was going to put on there next. Just to recap where we were. Um, in order to achieve the fusion that we need, 
in order for the von Neumann part, the hardcore, to work with the FPGA, the programmable cores or logic. We were going to use Python as the common interface. So on the FPGA side, we're using NMyGen. And then that left, well, what's the best thing to use on the uh, Python side for the ESP32? So my first port of call was to have a look at the MicroPython. Um, the trouble is, when it comes to, there is quite a bit of ESP32 support, but there isn't um, the support from the S2 version. Um, bear me a sec, there's something else I've just realized here. Why can't I see that box? Just let me check that my chat's working. Yeah, it is. So, I spent quite a bit of time going through the MicroPython stuff, but I couldn't find anything mature, let alone released on the MicroPython side for the S2. As I said, the stuff for the ESP32, but not the ESP32 S2. I think there's quite a bit of interesting work being done, but I think the way that the MicroPython folks are looking at that is they want to be able to do it from within the ESP IDF framework. I think the way that the ESP stuff was done before was done externally to that rather than within the ESP IDF framework. So I think the opinion is certainly of some people that are working in that area is they're trying to get it working inside the IDF. So that's why we're not seeing the MicroPython support in there. Um, I was a bit surprised. I thought it was a bit more advanced on that front than it actually was. Um, however, all is not lost because the second way of doing it was using something called CircuitPython. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Now, CircuitPython is something that was started by Adafruit and I'm, I'm sure you guys um, are familiar with that. Let me get you a link whilst I'm here. Um, and you can take a look. So CircuitPython is actually, believe it or not, based on top of MicroPython. I think they started off using much of the MicroPython code base. And then at some point they decided to adopt a different policy on the development front because what they wanted to do was support quite a wide range of boards but they wanted to fix the APIs, the application programming interfaces and the way that those APIs were structured and put together for different peripherals such that the circuit Python build would, when it is built, 
test itself against all of the existing ports a port being a different processor so for example it supports uh, stm 32s it's uh, which are the arm cortex it also supports the micro chip sam d21 sam the 51s i think so it's the m0s and the m4s i mean basically if you have a look at the the boards that support python on adafruit it basically supports um those boards and the chips on them but it also got extended out there are lots of other people that have made boards that wanted circuit python support which have been added to it um, and included in there was, I believe, ESP8266 originally. So there was an ESP8266 port. Then there was an ESP32 port. And then over the last few months, um, Scott, who uh, is effectively contracted um, by Adafruit, to write uh, lots of the circuit Python stuff has done has spent oh the last four months basically porting everything so it works on the ESP thirty two S two. I say everything, that's not strictly true. Some of the base things and he's done a lot of work. Now it turns out that um Circuit Python is actually fairly sophisticated. Um, I can see the advantages of having those standard APIs. So if you do a Py Circuit Python release, you're effectively you're supporting all of those boards that you supported before automatically. It's backward compatible because the APIs are fixed. It also means there's lots of common hardware abstraction layer parts that don't change or if they do change they all change in unison um, so you get good code reuse which is nice the setup for the development of, Py of circuit python is also fairly sophisticated now They've done a fairly magnificent job, really, in terms of what they're doing, the number of people working on it. Um, it's all done on GitHub. It's all open source. But they are, they have all sorts of back-end integration using continuous integration on GitHub. So it will go off and it will build all the different variants. So you make a ch change and it will go off and build all the different variants. Uh, and run a whole bunch of tests on those variants to make sure that nothing nothing breaks on the changes that are being made to it. So the process of putting new things in is more convoluted, if you like, in that sense, but it's also more structured, and it's certainly very well supported. Um, so I've spent quite a bit of time following what Scott's doing on this front. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the nuts and bolts of Circuit Python, then it's definitely worth taking a look. So if you, I mean, you can either view it on Twitch or YouTube. Adafruit have a presence on both. When Scott does his streams, he uses Restream.io, I think, to both platforms. I'm not doing anything nearly as sophisticated as that. I'm just on Twitch at the moment. But um, what you want to have a look at is Scott's deep dives. Um, and if you want to go back and look at those over the last few months, you'll see the work that he's been doing. You know, as he's working on it, as he's developing and porting uh, the ESP32 S2 stuff, getting it working in Circuit Python, um, and they have some pretty sophisticated support. 
for sockets and things don't forget because with the ESP stuff you've got all the Wi-Fi um, features in there as well so there's an awful lot of work that's gone into the libraries supporting the TCP IP the UDPs the socket layers etc etc and trying to do that on you know incredibly small amounts of memory um, because that's what it's like on microcontrollers um, circuit python like MicroPython still has fairly large requirements in terms of um, not necessarily memory I mean, it needs a decent amount of memory um, but it, it's you need to be able to um, load in a lot of Python modules and libraries for it to be useful those start off in flash um, and then you load them into RAM as you're using them when you're doing your imports at the top of your Python for example underneath they're using effectively a C Python and of course micro Python micro Python is in there as a core part so a lot of the peripheral stuff is actually written in C not in Python whereas the higher level stuff for handling that is written in Python written in Python so it's really very cool uh, very interesting and as I said Scott has done some fantastic work on getting the S2 done so it became obvious that there was no point in me pursuing the pure micro Python strategy at this point there's still a lot of work to do on that side so for now I'm gonna go with getting the um, circuit Python working so I've had some fun playing around with um, the micro Python stuff um, and getting that working um, the other thing again it's slightly opinionated versus micro Python approach Adafruit wanted to get their stuff working on their boards and they wanted some degree of unification on that so for example one of the standard parts of circuit Python is a thing called tiny USB let me see if I can dig up a URL for that as well hold on I think it's this one. I think this is the right home for it. So it's a cross it's an open source cross platform USB where it's host and device stack. There's more device than host in it, uh, and it's quite small as well. Um, so all of the USB stuff that they're doing is based around running tiny USB. Uh, again, this is part of their having a standard set of APIs across their boards, and obviously it's they're supporting things like the STM32, etc., etc., as well as the ESP S2 on there. So the other thing that Adafruit decided was important is providing a simple and easy interface. So once you once you get I mean you can download the binaries for circuit Python that are already made and it's a fairly easy install when you do it uh, in my case it wasn't easy because I'm currently using their circuit Python 
version 6 alpha uh, 3 or 4 I can't remember the exact version um, which means that I have to manually build something and it is a big download not only that they use sub modules as well on git and you have to kind of do the sub module recurse to get all the pieces you know like tiny USB like the in my case USB 32 uh, IDF stuff um, and it can take ages actually getting it all installed and downloaded and updated and recursively um, downloaded and then eventually you get there and you can actually run some builds I had real problems um, partly because I was using Windows subsystem for Linux WSL um, circuit Python the guy at circuit Python made a decision to go with CMake and the default version of that I had was too old for it to work but I think I obviously didn't check the documentation on this particular newer version but it has a requirement that means it needs a much newer version of CMake than I had and even after doing an update uh, you know with AppGet and everything else it still seemed to be way behind where I needed to be so and uh, it took me ages to work out it was CMake that was causing a problem but um, I spent quite a bit of time talking to various people actually on discourse on one of the Adafruit uh, on the circuit Python development uh, channel and I kind of eventually worked out that it was CMake after trying a million and one other things that other people suggested so in the end what I had to do was download CMake build it from source and I was kind of worried whether that was going to work on WSL but it did all kind of work out in the end and I managed to get it working and I managed to get it compiling and stuff so what happens is when you get this built what you have to do is you again use um, you flash it onto the development board in this case the Kaluga one um, using the normal uh, USB port not my modded one in this case then you restart it after flashing the board and then it comes up in MicroPython and the, what you get uh, from the way that they standardize their USB is you get two USB devices come up uh, one is obviously a COM port which is actually running at relatively low speed I think like 9600 which gave me a few issues to start with and then the other thing comes out as a storage device which is really cool um, so probably share that so you can see what that looks like uh, let me capture temporarily uh, hopefully I won't give too much away here in terms of files So here what you see is um, obviously I'm running Windows in this case on here you see a device that comes up a disk called uh, circuit Pi in this case D and then on that you see um, a library directory is which is where your libraries go and these are cross compiled libraries MPYs so they're a bit more space efficient um, and more importantly you get um, 
code file. Now, I will open that in a second to explain. What that is giving you a view of is a partition of the onboard quad SPI flash. Um, in this case, on the uh, Kaluga One development board. So this is a, I think it's a four megabyte flash. No, two megabyte flash. Partition. So that's what you're viewing there is um, something that is um, very simple to get to. And you can then directly access that. Mr. Laurie saying here, I tend to use Visual Box VMs on Windows laptop rather than WSL, as you can run the latest Ubuntu, and it's much more standard than WSL. Yeah, no, you're right, Laurie. I mean, I spent ages trying to get it working, but I was determined to do it. One of the things I need to do is actually update to WSL2, which is much better. But there's a bit of a process with doing that down to the version of Windows I've got. Um, had I been using WSL2, I wouldn't have even had this problem. But anyhow, I digress. So the other thing you can do is if I go back to my editor, get rid of that so remember we've got that code uh, file there um, let's just turn that off because it's in the way now Hmm. It's annoying. Let me see if I can open it in the same window. <laughs> That's not good. Oh, that's super annoying. Come on, open in this window, please. Preferences, can I turn that to do that? Can I add a folder to this separately? God, that's annoying. Right. Okay, let's see if we can um, do it the hard way. Let's add. Let's get rid of that. Switch it round. Sorry. I have some teething issues. Can you see the... Uh, Right one now here. So what I've got here is I've opened that uh, Circuit Python storage device directory, if you like, and then in here I can open the code file, um, Ooh. 
I <laughs> changed it. Oops. I was testing something else. Damn. Let me just get that back to what it was. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got some examples on here. No, I have to put the examples down there. Circuit Python examples. I'm pretty sure there was a simple one on here. Okay. Uh, and do 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 do. One of the things I was trying to do here, because I was just setting up for um, programming the um, the lattice dev board for the ICE 40, one of the things I was testing was reading files. Um, So that I could uh, read the read the um, binary, the chip file, to from the uh, flash, and then program the chip with it. So I was running, I was testing how the file handling was working on this. Um, let's get rid of this. We don't need that. So basically what I was doing here was, in this case, I was just opening the um, same file that I'm editing here, effectively. And then I was using the read lines function on the file and printing the... Uh, Printing the lines out, but actually, actually, when you do the F read lines, you get you actually get a list back with typical Python, really. And then you can print it out. So um, actually, if I 
Let me see if I can just get that working and I can show you. I mean, it's not the best example, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes I'm doing here. So I'm just going to run putty to set up the uh, port, which I'm guessing is COM9. Um, once that's set up, I can just use WSL, in fact. Do, do, do. I think I've got an instance running for all of that. Yeah. So if I just cat dev TTYS, it's COM9. So in this case, uh, push it up. Get rid of putty. So if I go and save this file, remember I'm editing this effectively as a mounted disk on Windows. When I save this, watch what happens in the terminal. I can show you. Let me just add that in. Add do, 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 Windows Capture Terminal. Oh, no, this is uh, WSL. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I wonder if I can make that any bigger. No. Typical. I can't easily do that. So if I now go to the editor and do a save. Absolutely nothing happens. That's interesting. Uh, let me just get that. Just, just kill the cat. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, why did it. Why is it not opening that buffer? Uh, you can actually see that it ran there. Hmm. I wonder. If I do that again, and I do a save. There we go. Work that time. That's weird. Anyhow, so this is the output from what I've just run. So every time I save my changes on this file that I'm editing, it sends a signal because it's monitoring the the traffic over the um, storage device so it actually sends a signal saying it's changed then it actually reruns the file so here you actually see the output you know file opened and then you see it printing the list of strings or lines of the original file in this case and then it says finish drawing which is wrong finish listing would be better to so save that there you go. So you can immediately see some changes. The other thing you can do is you can run the REPL over the serial port if you want to as well. Let me just catch up with what Laurie's saying here. I think he's for ULX3, MicroPython is still better than CircuitPython. The CircuitPython does not support processes running in the background. Yeah, I need to come back to that. Um, so, for example, CircuitPython won't support the FTP server that allows you to FTP bit streams straight to the FPGA.
and they have to be faster than the SD card left memory. It also won't support on screen display that lets you select bit streams and game ROMs. I need to understand that better. Right, some of these things would be nice on this board. Um, this is a ULX3 ESP32 MicroPython, including experimental circuit Python version. Yep, okay, I, I concur. That I know there are some changes coming in circuit Python. There, it, it does already support um, background processing. But frankly, it's a bit clumsy the way that it's implemented at the moment. Um, probably the best way of doing it will be by taking advantage of perhaps running the RTOS properly. Then you get all of that stuff for free. At the moment, you have to specify. Well, basically, I think what you have to do is you have to yield to what's called a background task. So there is support for it in CircuitPython, but it's primitive. I think they're improving it, but it's still primitive. I'd like to see that, you know, run a, a kind of RTOS level or something similar. I can see where you're coming from, Laurie. I don't get the on-screen display bit. You'd need to explain that a bit better in terms of running background tasks. Obviously, that would be um, nice to have. Uh, what else are you using? So you're saying in this case you're using FTP. Still there, circuit Python doesn't support processors. So Python won't support. Yeah, one of the other things that you've got to be careful about is the memory usage when you start doing that as well. Um, but yeah, making that a bit more transparent would be a handy thing. Um, and there's nothing stopping you adding in some other clever bits and pieces to do that, even with the way that it's set up now, using their background task and their yielding support, particularly if you're doing something time consuming. Um, so you can actually yield to what's called the background task. When you're doing something that's taking some time, in other words, you you effectively uh, yield to anything else that needs running. Yeah, I don't know what version of Circuit Python they're using on there, but you're right. It 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 is an issue, but I don't really have any choice at this point because there is no proper S2 support on MicroPython yet. Um, having the background stuff is probably less of an issue, to be honest. Um, you could still do what you're saying as far as the memory transfers work over a Wi-Fi. You could still do that. I don't know about the on-screen thing because I'm not quite sure. You'd have to explain to me how you're doing that would be on-screen display in order to run the game ROMs. You need to understand how you're doing that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of circuit. I mean, it's actually circuit Python day today, believe it or not. What, how are we doing for time? 21.54. Yeah, I'm going to have to finish fairly shortly, but it's, it's circuit Python day today. According to a fruit 9th of the 9th uh, 2020 Circuit Python Day, so everyone's talking about that. Um, at Adafruit today, they're doing uh, a big push on it, but I think uh, they're certainly aware of the background issues and multitasking issues. Um, there are always some limits with that, but as far as ESP. 32 goes, I think it's running RTOS anyhow, pre-RTOS, 
So one of the things that you could possibly do is run circuit python in one of the threads for priatos one of the tasks and then have other tasks so i'm not sure how difficult it would be to make that happen that's another way of going so Laurie's saying the ULX free on screen display works like the Mr. FPGA. You'll have to remind me, it's a long time since I've seen the Mr. stuff. So, I mean, the way I see this working from our point of view is the Python layer is really an orchestration layer for stuff that can be going on concurrently. With the FPGA so and in terms of programming it it's quite easy so what I'm thinking here that the bit that I'm trying to get working at the moment is um, we can use mmigen part of the Python metacode if you like the model to upload directly to disk or over Wi-Fi but let's keep it simple for the moment um, so that will upload directly to disk so you'd effectively have your, you know, um, chip dot bin or logic dot bin, whatever we call it, sitting there on that flash. And as soon as it sees that, it can upload that directly into the FPGA to make that live as well. And then run the Python that you're running, your Python code to actually talk to that. Okay, what's I saying? The OSD reads the bitstream and ROMs from the SD card. Sends the data to the FPGA, which overlays it on VGA or HDMI. The OSD is interrupt driven and runs in the background. Okay, right. Um, it's possible to do something like that. We can also have interrupts as well. Circuit Python does support interrupts, but we will have an, an umbilical driver between the ESP32 and the FPGA that, as I've mentioned before, will be from SPI all the way up to Octo SPI, which is a pretty low latency. Yeah, I'd be interested in looking at that a bit more. But there might be different ways of cracking that, that egg um, using the features that we will have. It could certainly be interrupt driven if we need it to be interrupt driven. And we could use the background tasks. The other alternative is can we use the RTOS tasks so that the circuit Python effectively runs? As one artist task. The issue there would be there could be some memory issues. I'd have to understand that better. I don't know exactly what Adafruit are thinking. Whether they go with an artos type solution longer term. They're certainly very aware of being able to solve that. But it, it, it's, it's something that they know about and are actively working on. I just don't know which way they're going to go about that. They'll probably just improve the background task part for the moment. But maybe the longer term thing is to use an RTOS to do the other stuff. Whether that means that you can run multiple circuit pythons, for example, I don't I don't know if that makes much sense. Yeah, although QSP Laurie's saying that'd be better than just using SPI or QSPI. 
so Octo Spy is effectively or eight, eight lane spy is faster because you can do a byte a clock cycle. But um, again, if you're using QSP already on the ULX3, that should be pretty pretty fast anyhow. That can do a nibble at a time. Um, but there's all sorts of other things that we can do. There is an additional line that we can either use as a strobe. It can be used to control buffering. If you're writing into a FIFO, maybe using um, memory mapping or something like that. It's going to be interesting to try and experiment with these different ways of doing it to see see what what works best, I guess. So that's where we are with that. Um, so I've now got a, the good thing is I'm now. I've become very familiar with Circuit Python, as you can imagine, in order to get it work here. And my next step is to get it programming the ICE 40 directly over the other board, um, which is next on my list. There's actually a bug in the SPI driver for the ESP32 S2 on Circuit Python, although I believe Scott's working on that today as part of his stream. So uh, hopefully that should get fixed. That'll make it easier for me to program the ICE 40. Um, now he's saying the user can press buttons or keys to bring the on screen to try and navigate to a bit screen or going on the morning. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that use case, Laurie, and try and work out how to do that. That's interesting, that's a good problem. I like that. Yeah, it's a good feature to have, I think. Definitely. I like it. <clears throat> Let me just check my list then. Oh, uh, one of the other things, I got a new camera it arrived today. So I'm going to use this. So when I'm doing the work soldering and stuff like that, I've got this puppy, which is kind of cool. Um, it has USB and it has HDMI on it. Come on, focus. Which is nice. However, I do not yet have a lens for it. That's coming. I've got a nice zoom lens. But in there is a Panasonic 38 megapixel CCD. Which is going to be cool. But what that enables me to do is zoom in from quite a long distance so I can move the camera around above the stuff I'm working on. That's kind of going to be useful. Looking forward to getting that working. But I can't do anything till I get the um, lens for it. Uh, what else was I going to mention? Um, uh, the components for the board are coming. I had a whole load from L. C S C they're coming hopefully tomorrow. We've got a few more bits coming from Mauser. Um the board, but I'm not gonna see the boards until probably back in the next week earliest I would imagine. Um they're still finishing the production, so they haven't even started shipping those yet. Um And I've got the bits to build some more um, Black Ice MX uh, carriers. So I'm going to start work on those as well. Get those out. Get the stock back up. So that's kind of where I am with this. Um, next stream, I'm not sure. Depends on where we get to. It's probably going to be... Maybe some circuit Python stuff. I hope to be programming the ICE 40 directly from circuit Python and playing around maybe with NMIGEN to generate and then program. Start looking at that. Have a think about some other things that Laurie said as well. That would be interesting. Uh, the other thing that you guys could think about is. is uh, at the moment, I've got a normal USB connector on the alloy. 
do I go USB-C it's gonna be tricky I need to rearrange the status LEDs to do that but something to think about how important is USB-C okay well that will do me I'm gonna wrap up now because uh, I do have to uh, do something else now sorry about the issues at the start uh, I did make sure I restarted everything restarted the machine the switch etc and then the internet let me down it just takes so long to reconnect sometimes it's kind of strange the way that works but when it does it's normally perfect afterwards so apologies for that guys um, I will look forward to uh, seeing you on the stream next time and don't forget to join me down at the forum I'll get some some of this stuff posted on the forum for some of the other folks down there as well um, yeah I mean that's something we can discuss on the forum is the USB-C uh, whether there is an advantage to going that route or not certainly there are some power advantages that can be had maybe um, hmm. okay guys well I'm going to close it down for now I look forward to speaking to you down at the forum and um, streaming again next week thank you for your patience once more um, I think next stream is probably going to be software oriented uh, some of the circuit Python work and I'll have a think about some of the things that Laurie said and see what's possible on that front. Okay, guys. Well, listen, have a great evening, what's left of it. Um, if you're interested, hop along to Twitch now or Adafruit on YouTube uh, because I think uh, Scott should be starting to stream, uh, hopefully fixing this SPI problem. I'm certainly going to go and have a look in and see what he's doing. But anyhow. Thanks for being with us, guys, and I will see you soon.